Thank you, Sanjay, and uh, it's always a pleasure to come here to this distinguished meeting. And I would like to say that probably this is one of the most important meetings in sports category now in, in Europe, and, and this is a compliment to the organizers and, and, and CRY. Uh, so, my, to my topic is exercise recommendation in athletes with ischemic heart disease, and it's the update of the ESC recommendations now coming out in 2018. And uh, this is how the new recommendations look like, and they are available on the internet, so you can look them up uh, and, uh, and, and download the PDF. And this is uh, actually, it is an update. Let's see if this works. Yeah, it is an update from the 2005 recommendations. And this is built on as much evidence as we have and also added to that expert opinion. And the scope of these recommendations is coronary artery disease, which is the main part of them, uh, part of the recommendations, but also other entities uh, associated with myocardial ischemia, like coronary artery anomaly, coronary artery dissection, uh, or myocardial bridging. So first of all, coronary artery disease. Um, as you well know, the most common cause of death in master athletes, like shown here on the picture, is coronary artery disease. And already from the age of 25, I would like to point out, is maybe 50% of the cases is coronary artery disease. And over 35, certainly uh, over 80%, as previously mentioned. And also we know that if you have an underlying coronary artery disease, physical activity is, is a potential trigger, and it could increase the risk uh, from two up to 56 times to having a, a cardiac arrest. Uh, as shown by previous studies. So we know this. And uh, then again comes the difficult question, what advice to give them? Uh, we have all this spectrum of, of, of athletes coming with, with a high risk profile for, for coronary artery disease, increased calcium score perhaps. And, and I think we can come back to calcium score later, Sanjay, if there is a one minute or two during the day to discuss. And also plaque on, on CT angio. And, and more advanced disease, stable coronary artery disease, previous MI, post-PCI. What do we recommend, really? I mean, more activity or less activity? There are cases for both, of course. Starting with the recommendations here for asymptomatic and, and patients at risk for coronary artery disease, these include uh, those with... Uh, these include those with having high risk for coronary artery disease, high risk profile, uh, pro possibly subclinical disease, and also those with, uh, for instance, a high coronary artery calcium score. So, as you well know, atherosclerosis is a progressive disease and it starts early and then continues through life. And one of the two, two of the most important risk factors is age and, 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 and sex. And then the other risk factors add to that. Uh, so, if you have an athlete in middle aged, this is coming from the, from, you see the, you see the figure down to your right at the bottom, you can see this middle-aged Gothenburg people. If you have a woman, if you're between 50 and 55, you have about 30% risk of having coronary plaques. This is the normal population. Uh, and if you are over 60 to 65 in a man, you have 77% risk of having coronary plaques. So we, they do have, they do have plaques to, to a large extent uh, as, as you get older. So this is very important to remember. So it is about risk stratification and not so much about having uh, the disease or not. And, and we do recommend risk factor profiling and, and using the, the traditional score. In, in US you would use Framingham, it's the same thing and, and it's, it adds to the, the, the risk. And you add the traditional risk factors, blood pressure, age, sex, smoking, total cholesterol. Add to that, we recommend to use the exercise test, we think it's crucial and it's still recommended. Uh, and uh, we look at, of course, all the things you, you would know, heart rate, blood pressure, maximum exercise capacity, ECG changes, both uh, as the segment changes for, for ischemic changes and also arrhythmias, and also looking for symptoms, of course. So, but we have to stress that it's a maximal exercise test is the key, not the subclinical we might do in, or, or symptom oriented we might do in, in clinical practice. This will add a, a predictive power to the risk. It'll give also functional information. Uh, we know that exercise test, of course, has a very low yield in low risk patients, but it's not recommended, as we see so soon in the recommendations, to do that. It, but, but when you have risk factor and higher risk profile, the, the yield is higher, and if you do have symptoms, it's even higher, as shown in the figure below to the, to the right. And uh, of course, if there is an unequivocal test, if, you, if it's a gray zone test you have to do, we recommend st additional stress testing. But you have to really do a maximal exercise test. So starting with the uh, uh, asymptomatic, and the K was jumping there, I see a line. But uh, starting with the asymptomatic ones, 
you can see that this could be the one with high risk factors. Let's see if I can point here. Uh, could be high risk factors. We recommend an exercise test. Could also be somebody having a coronary artery calcium score jo uh, just coming to your office. And, 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 and then we also recommend to do an exercise test. So, in summarize, if you have these patients with asymptomatic, either high risk factors, asymptomatic disease, example, a high coronary calcium score. If the exercise test is showing no ischemia, we, there is no limitation for exercise uh, eligibility. But also, as pointed out by Sanjay, uh, effective risk, uh, risk factor management is advocated. So these are these patients. And then coming to the ones with clinically proven coronary disease, we also recommend to, to look at uh, ischemia and arrhythmias, uh, but also myocardial, myocardial dysfunction. And adding to that, I think it's important that we also uh, say that you should consider the type and level of, of, of sport competition, the fitness level of the individual, and also the profile of risk factors, including age, which is I've uh, just added there in red. So uh, coming to that part of the equation, this is also the figure from, from, the, from, the, um, uh, from the new paper. You can see if you do have an exercise test which is positive, of course you should do a, uh, or the exercise test could be uh, positive, you're leading to a CT angio, and the angio could of course be negative, then you're, you're out of this equation. But if it shows no significant coronary disease, or significant coronary disease, you should be, you should be uh, having a PCI. If it's non-significant, then we can risk stratify to low risk for cardiac events or high risk. And this is depending on the anatomy or the functional information, getting from echo uh, and exercise test. So, uh, the high risk for coronary events is the ones to have uh, critical stenosis or uh, low ejection fraction, uh, ischemia on exercise, dyspnea symptoms on exercise, dizziness, syncope, or, or arrhythmias, or, or maybe a high degree of scarring. So, so these are the ones who are the high risk for coronary events. And the opposite, of course, for the low, uh, low risk group, if you, then it's the opposite here. The, you know, no, the ejection fraction is normal, you have no arrhythmias, no ischemia, and, 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 and uh, exercise capacity is normal. And if you, do, if you have that, even if you had a previous MI or, or known coronary disease, uh, which is non-significant, or may, maybe operated or not, then you're eligible if you have no ischemia, uh, and the functional capacity is good, then you're also eligible for most sports at competitive level even. And this is much more liberating than the last recommendations from 2005. However, as pointed out here, these, these, uh, you have to consider also the type of sports. So for extreme sports, you have to individualize this, and also if the athletes are older, coming up to 60, remembering that there is a great chance that they might have underlying disease there. So the risk is higher also in, in plus 60s. So this is what the recommendations are, much more liberated even if you have known coronary disease. So just to round up, because I'm the one standing between you and coffee, so I would just like to say that, uh, that uh, the, these last three small entities, I would say, not so small, important, but not a, a big part of, of the paper, coronary anomaly, which you should, of course, be expected in somebody who has exercise-related syncope or chest pain. And if you have the diagnosis as here, you have the anomalous uh, left um, coronary artery coming from the, from the right uh, ostium here, and it's compressed between the, the great arteries, and also maybe your angle takeoff, and especially this patient is at high risk for sudden cardiac arrest, and this is, uh, in this case, we are recommended to, to consider surgical, uh, uh, surgical intervention and also uh, caution about, uh, uh, about uh, sports eligibility, which is discouraged. Uh, so this is just showing the, the, the there is other uh, more benign forms of coronary anomaly as well, where more more liberating uh, recommendations. For my colleague Bridging, similar symptoms, exercise-induced angina or syncope, which is very important if you have a young athlete with uh, exercise-induced chest pain or exercise-induced syncope, you should consider these two things, uh, both bridging and coronary anomaly. Of course, it's, uh, the, the, the myocardium could, uh, to a varying degree, uh, be above, so to speak, the coronary artery, which is embedded, and this could cause, potentially cause ischemia and arrhythmias. And here, 
it's, uh, the, the consensus is that it seems to be more benign. If you do not have any symptoms and do not have any uh, signs of ischemia, uh, all sports uh, are, are allowed here. And even less we know about coronary dissection. Uh, so what we do know is it may be underappreciated and it's possibly a high recurrence rate. We do advocate caution. That's because we have so little studies on this. And, and, and uh, the, the recommendations are restrictive regarding eligibility, which is discouraged in these patients. And of course, we also s clearly state that more research is needed for this particular entity. So in summary, I mean, the new recommendations on, on coronary artery disease is more, more liberating in a way, uh, because in the 2005 recommendations, if you have, any, if you have coronary artery disease, you are out of, of, of competitive sports, which is not uh, always the case now. Thank you very much.